Um, but I want to introduce myself. My name is Tim Rathman. I'm a geologist. I'm the president of one of the uh, sort of collaborative groups here with the members in transition, the Denver International Petroleum Society, sort of a legacy group of a bunch of, you know, experienced folks in the industry. But um, I just kind of wanted to, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'll hand it over to Emily Gentry in a little bit, who introduced our speaker. But, uh, you know, there's been a number of these member in transition presentations and uh, just wanted to kind of uh, emphasize the, the, the next one after this. Um, if and let me see if I can. Uh, is it going to be on November 4th where we're going to have, you know, uh, uh, Brian Black with Geosciences Man Manager at MI3. He's going to be doing uh, something about CO2 and ants oil recovery of a field in Wyoming. So registration is open for that. And I encourage you to intend. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I'll go ahead and, and hand it over to Emily. And um, uh, appreciate everyone coming and uh, hope you enjoy the presentation. So Emily, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks so much, Tim. Um, for those of you that don't know my face or name, I am Emily. I organize the Denver Geothermal Community um, which has been a series with MIT to really focus on creating a discussion and momentum towards geothermal. Um, so today we have jo Joseph Batir um, talking with us. He is a senior geothermal geoscientist who specializes in thermal resource characterization in sedimentary basins and ge geospatial analysis for greenfield resource exploration. He has his bachelor's in science um, and geology from Southern Illinois University, and then a master's in geothermal energy and a PhD in geophysics from Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Um, he's worked, and he's going to talk about this, he's worked both domestic and international um, on geothermal projects, and he currently is working as a um, senior geothermal geoscientist for PetroLearn, leading their geothermal technical team um, to uh, analyze their thermal resource characterization. So with that, I will hand it over to Joe. Um, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I will field them. We'll answer most of them at the end. Um, make sure you're muted, please, and turn off your camera. All right, can you see that? Yep, looks good. That looks good. All right, go. very good. Thank you for that introduction. I, I'm i gonna shut off my camera to save bandwidth. Seems like I always have bandwidth problems. Um, and Emily, I noticed you did not attempt to pronounce the University of Akureyri, even though you've been to Iceland. It is a difficult one to to get. That was where I did my master's. So I guess I, I will get started. This is a discussion of domestic and international hydrocarbon to geothermal well conversion projects. These are not necessarily all projects that, that, that I have worked on. It is, it is more of a more of a presentation on public facing projects that, that have been discussed, that have been published on that are, are really what, what we can kind of learn about well conversion when we're talking a lot of, lot of discussion out there right now is about hydrocarbon to geothermal well conversion. And this is kind of the easiest data set to collect, to look at. And notice I'm not really saying analyze because it is a small data set. It is variable and low quality. And I don't think it, it is not a statistical representation at this time. So, so we're still in the very, very early stages of, of well conversion, even though it has a, a very long process and we'll see examples going back to 2008. With that, I will stop rambling about that and get into the outline. So we'll talk about what is this geothermal well conversion? Why? Why are we talking about well conversion? Really the difference is well conversion versus drilling new wells. The case studies are, are we're going to go 
clockwise around the world, starting in the US, looking at different case studies. And then I'll give you my, my thoughts, common trends, and maybe some ways that we can can further well conversion and improve this. And then some more broad, basic conclusions. So this is a fairly high level talk, but I think there are some insights here for anybody who is, is looking into this well conversion idea that, that you can glean from actually looking at all the different information we have in, in the public sphere. First, I do want to give a, a short introduction on PetroLearn. Who are we and why are we talking about geothermal? Well, we are a technology development company. We leverage tools like AI, machine learning, and, and automated workflows to perform geospatial data analytics to look at, to develop diverse adaptable geothermal play fairway analyses. And from our play fairway analyses, we go even further downstream from exploration into thermal hydromechanical modeling. We've developed tools to try and efficiently look at well screening and well conversion. And we also work with, with consultants to design traditional and innovative power plants so that we could really utilize the geothermal resources in the best possible way. So we are, we develop integrated workflows that provide a unique data-driven clean solution. Now this is, this is very high level, just in case anybody who is watching is not familiar with geothermal. Geothermal has many energy uses. What we're really focused on today is gonna to be the low temperature electricity generation. Right now, that's about 95 degrees Celsius. In the right conditions, you can generate electricity down to 75 degrees Celsius, those right conditions being Fairbanks, Alaska. That conversion there is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. There are new technologies that are pushing these temperatures even lower on what that geothermal resource is. And, and that is potentially going to be available more broadly than just the Arctic. One thing I wanna point out, so you've got electricity generation. Electricity generation is only one small part of all of the geothermal energy uses. There are many important, significant uses for industrial low-grade heat. This includes controlled climate agriculture, food processing, heating and cooling of both residential and commercial buildings, and many other things such as mushroom culture, lumber drying, pulp and paper processing, aquaculture, and who doesn't love a good bath, a good warm bath. So there's a lot of different uses, and we will actually kind of touch on that looking at the use, the case studies that not everybody is looking at power generation. And I think that is something that we do need to consider is not only looking at power generation, because while that is something that everybody understands, everybody likes to have electricity, it's, it's not, everybody also uses heating and cooling. So what is geothermal in the oil field? Well, to lay it out, we've got one, a, a very basic drawing of some type of production area. This can be a vertical well. This could be horizontal wells, all producing from one pad. That production goes to a separator. That separator separates off your hydrocarbons to sell. Your produced water eventually ends up getting disposed of, whether that's in some type of disposal horizon or whether it's getting trucked off. That's typically your, your very, very basic hydrocarbon system or production system. What we're doing now, very simply put, and this is oversimplified, we are taking that produced water after the separator, we are taking in hot water, 
utilizing that heat, stripping that heat off, pumping out cold water to go get disposed of. And then we're taking that heat and producing either electricity or some type of heat application. So that's the idea. What exactly is this in terms of hard numbers? One example we're gonna talk about is from China. And that's what these lines here are for, very, very faint. This is a chart from Maria Richard. She made this based on the Future of Geothermal Report that was published by MIT in 2006. The basic idea is that if you have a working temperature of one of these, you can calculate your potential kilowatt production based on how many barrels of water per day you have, your temperature of flow rate, and then you can estimate your kilowatt production. So if we're looking at something like a produced water of 225 Fahrenheit, and we're producing around 18,000 barrels of water per day, the expected energy output is going to be around 500 to 600 kilowatts. And that is based on the data that was in the future of, of geothermal report published in 2006. The one thing to point out here is that the goal of, of kind of this chart and once you get to the point of utilization is to design a power system to maximize that waste heat recovery. Here, we're really just talking about well fluids, your wastewater, but this could also be pulling in heat from an internal combustion engine exhaust or from compressor stations that have a lot of heat being given off through the process. So we don't need to limit ourselves just to produced water. When we're thinking about this, this idea of, of electricity production in the oil field, we need to be thinking about all ways to recovery. To zoom in on this little, this little trapezoid, what that is is most often a low temperature binary geothermal power system. You've got your production well and your injection well. What's going on here is you are producing that hot water. It's going through a heat exchanger. That heat exchanger is exchanging the heat from, from the subsurface via the water, warming up a working fluid here that eventually ends up turning to steam, flashes to steam, and that steam spins this turbine to generate electricity. In this way, if we're using a binary system, because you have all of your produced fluids being directly re-injected, this is a zero emissions power production. So why well conversion? The main, the main discussion is often well conversion versus drilling new wells. Here, we're gonna look at a United Kingdom oil field production history example. For this field, the, the White Farm field, there was fairly high initial oil production and eventually a very high water cut. As you have a field maturing, oftentimes you get higher water. This could be different depending on what type of field you have if you're in unconventionals, but this is a more conventional oil and gas field. What happens is eventually, so you get increased water production with age. At some point, this could be either natural water drive or you start flooding the field in a secondary recovery water flood situation. And then at some point, your wells get p and plugged and abandoned once it's no longer economic. The important part here, and why we're talking about well conversion, is because all this water, that is a water, that is a resource, and that water has some type of heat in it. 
that heat you can you can take and utilize that is that heat has a thermal value and that value is now a once you get further off into your production stream and you start PNAing these wells you have now closed off that thermal resource and you're essentially throwing it away so the real question is if you were to utilize the heat within all of this water could you extend the life of your field or could you ultimately fully convert this field into geothermal power production and not even have to rely on oil production. Now, cost comparison. This is the, the closest to a one-to-one -one comparison that I can make. This is in the Williston Basin. And, and I, I, I show this slide in a lot of different presentations. It's very important for, to point out with both of these projects, provided that they succeed and they are generating clean, renewable power, and they are generating it at a cost that the end user is happy with, these are successful projects. It is important though, that these are different size investments. These are different markets and they are different timelines. For well repurposing one project that that was done in the Williston Basin was the University of North Dakota Continental Resources co-production system. And I'll talk about details of that project later. Here, I just wanna give a very broad overview. The size was 250 kilowatts. The cost per Will Gosnold and the, the published numbers, the cost was $3,400 per kilowatt. The timeline on this, from building it out, from the, the awarding of the DOE money to building it out was on the order of nine months, I think. So a timeline for a repurposing project really is, is about how long it takes to, to buy and manufacture the modular power system and then installation. This is more or less a proven field with proven technology that is ready to deploy. The investor, this size is, so this project specifically was 900, maybe $940,000. So the investor size is on the millions of dollar scale. So these are small to mid-sized energy companies, maybe family offices would be interested in this. New drilling, this is a project, the Deep Earth Energy Production new drilling project. This is phase one of the project. Their size is going to be an install capacity of 32 megawatts. The cost based on calculations from their, from their investor, investor presentations would be about $5,400 per kilowatt. Timeline, this is a generous timeline, basically from from exploration, the first drilling until first power is about four to five years based on their current timeline and, and where they're headed. And the investor here, we're talking about 32, 32 megawatts. This breaks down to about $5 million per megawatt. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars this is an institutional investor, private equity, or potentially the open market. And so this is a very, this is a larger investment and a longer term payout, but a much larger way to, to deploy capital. Now the Williston Basin, again, that is further north, northern latitudes. In case you are wondering, these projects can also happen in the South. So this is a different area, similar size project for a well repurposing existing co-production. The resource, and this is a project that we've scoped out, resource is about 7,500 barrels of water per day at about 270 Fahrenheit. Similar temperatures, similar flow rates, size is about 125 kilowatts. And the cost estimates, 
that we've come up with are $3,000 to $3,500 per kilowatt, generating power at three to five cents per kilowatt hour. The end use here would be behind the fence power use or potentially nearby potential industry buyers of the power and or heat. So these projects exist. They are from the south to the north. And hopefully I've convinced you that well repurposing can generate power at, at low prices and would be a, a good investment, a small investment, but a good investment. In case I haven't said it, here are the details or broad overviews, cost of for screening and well conversion. As long as you have an efficient well screening process to reduce the risk, you can increase excessive probability. And then the conversion to geothermal electricity saves and defers well abandonment costs and generates clean energy revenue and income. It can deliver electricity at Best case scenarios, three to five cents per kilowatt hour. And you can compare that to your local utility rate to see if that would make sense. The, the modular units that, that we've looked at can be around 125 kilowatts in the price range of half a million dollars or less. Using these kind of data, these kind of results, some high level financial estimates, you can get a typical internal rate of return greater than 10% if you're just doing the co-production and you can generate potentially higher in the best case scenarios of 15% or greater when you're just focused on the electricity. So this would be a co-production versus a full conversion pro project. And we'll actually look at some, some hard numbers, not of financials, but of actual production. Here, no tax credits are assumed. So I hope I've made the case for well conversion, why you should always look at this. Now, let me show some data behind that. Going clockwise, starting in the US. The first project is the Rocky Mountain Oil Field Testing Center. This ran from 2008 to 2012. This was one of the first co-production projects. So the Teapot Dome, Wyoming, ended up in government hands. It was a government oil field testing facility. And here they utilize an ORMAT Technologies 250 kilowatt ORC unit. The temperature of the resource was about 195 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit and producing anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 barrels of water per day. This generated 200 kilowatts net power. There is actual data behind this. One thing to point out that I like to always discuss, notice that the, the purple line is the production the blue line is ambient temperature. Notice how production increases when ambient temperature decreases. That is because the delta T be between the cooling side versus the hot water side ends up driving your efficiency. And since these are all air cooled, air cooling is, is cheaper and often kind of the only option because many of these systems are air cooled, you would notice as you get towards the summertime, you'll have drops in efficiency. So in the winter time, right in here, when your ambient air temperature is the lowest, you're gonna get an increase in efficiency. It's important to point out that the Rocky Mountain Oil Field Testing Center program was ultimately terminated when this field was sold and no longer in government control. The next project is Denbury Resources. This was in 2011. This is a project in Jones County, Mississippi. It ran from June to October of 2011. This was a Denbury Resources well. 
Gulf Coast Green Energy was the was one of the partners, and Electrotherm made utilize the the Electrotherm modular power system was utilized to generate the electricity. This was funded again by the government. This is the the REPC funding for this project. They generated roughly 23 kilowatts from 4,100 barrels of water per day at 204 degrees Fahrenheit. So notice it's significantly less power. This is a function of the flow rate and the simple fact that we're in Mississippi now and not Wyoming. This base load electricity was utilized on site to keep all the electricity inside the fence and to offset the, the power production or offset the, the energy that they had to buy. And this ended up being approximately 20% of the power that they had to use on site for their, for their ESP. And the power generated displaced the cost that they had to buy, which was nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So here it's important to point out that they had a net loss of power in the summer. The reason for this is because the cooling system, you can't really see it, this guy in the background. Again, it's an air-cooled system, which means in the summertime, you're trying to reject heat to a hot, muggy 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. When your resource is only 204 degrees Fahrenheit, that doesn't exactly work. So the cooling system was actually made too small and it was a, you had a net loss of power in the summer, which is why the project started in June and ran through October, but it ultimately wouldn't work out because it could only run about four to five months out of the year. The next project is the University of North Dakota Continental Resources Geothermal Power Plant. This is in Bowman County, North Dakota. Now, one interesting part about this project is that the water that they were getting was from a water disposal plant. So this was water that they were, that Continental Resources was producing and their, their goal with that water was to run it through a water flood, but they had to cool the water first. So all of the infrastructure was already there cooling the water. The difference now is that they actually added on these two 125 kilowatt units to then generate some, some electricity from that cooling process. This again was a DOE funded project. They, they proved out the concept generating 124 kilowatts of gross production from the South Tower. So there's a south and a north tower. They proved technical viability, but very quickly after there was an equipment failure early on. So there wasn't a long-term sufficient test similar to the Ramazzi field. Based on the project costs, the, the cost was $3,400 per kilowatt of installed capacity. And then the the price based on that very limited amount of data, they estimated that their price for electricity was going to be on the order of seven and a quarter cents per kilowatt hour. There are other US projects out there. I guess you, you could say there are other US projects. In 2009, Universal Geopower in the Gulf Coast, they received DOE funding to convert shut-in gas wells that were then planned for repurposing. The problem here is that those wells never actually got converted. They could not get a PPA or a power purchase agreement to justify the additional capital expenses that they would need beyond the DOE funding to make the project make sense. And then more recently in 2021, there was a, a 
funding opportunity announcement from the DOE called the Wells of Opportunity. Topic two, reamplify. The goal of this topic was one megawatt of electricity or 10 megawatts of thermal power production utilizing repurposed hydrocarbon wells. I don't think they've made an announcement yet. I haven't seen one, but the cool part about this is that there will be hopefully more projects coming online in the near future to continue proving out the concept of, of well conversion. But it's important to point out that technical successes have occurred in the US. And so we, we more or less have proven the technology and the ability to convert wells, but there are still no commercial projects. And that I, I think I talk about later on in the observations and conclusions. Moving north to Canada, there is the Tudica Geothermal Project, originally named Clark Lake. The Tudica Geothermal Prospect is in the gas field. This is in Northeast British Columbia. This is Fort Nelson First Nation owned. I include this project. Now this is going to be a new drill, but I'm including it here based on their previous data, the Clark Lake Slave Point A pool. Notice their production summary. Their current water production is on the order of 21,000 barrels of water per day. They're producing roughly 100,000 cubic meters of water. The, the, I think a cubic meter is roughly 6.3 barrels. So 100,000 cubic meters is roughly 630,000 barrels of water. This is per month, which breaks down to about 21,000 barrels of water per day. The temperatures they have are on the order of 110 degrees Celsius. And I also include this in here. So they probably could generate they could generate electricity using the existing production from the wells that are still open. It's also important to point out the Clark Lake gas field is here. It's within one of the higher gradient regions. And then all of these red areas are more of these mid Devonian pools. So there are, and then the, the more gray areas are these reefs that the Clark Lake field is within. So these reefs, some of them are in these higher regions and there is active gas production in some of these. So there are still, there are additional opportunities even following this specific play concept. There's another project that has been publicized, the Swan Hills Hybrid Geothermal. The Swan Hills Hybrid Geothermal Project, the Power Production Process Overview. And this is coming from the Futera, Futera Energy website. They're a Razor Energy subsidiary. They have natural gas production to produce. They run that through a natural gas turbine to produce electricity. That electricity ultimately gets sold. Within there, they've got a section with the turbine exhaust heat and geothermal heat recovery. So here, this is waste heat recovery from both the turbine exhaust and also the idea here is that you've got, you have all these existing wells within the Swan Hills unit reef. Those wells have hot water production and that hot water is going back into preheating and thermal recovery to then run an organic Rankine cycle, one of these binary systems. This section here is 21 megawatts. This is phase one. They're saying 30% of that is renewable. So if I were to, to do that math correctly, I think that's gonna be somewhere around six to seven megawatts. Of, of presumably geothermal power production that is part of this whole system. 
And it may end up being a combined heat and power system where they may also be producing heat somewhere. Their temperature is 100 degrees Celsius for their resource. And they also have on their website a net zero plan for phase two power. <clears throat> so they have further plans to reduce the carbon impact of this power production that they're doing. This project has been reported since 2019, but there are no publicly reported results on, on where they are in terms of, of development. It just says that they are in the they're in the construction phase. So there's other Canadian projects. I think it's important to point out these other Canadian projects are also in hot sedimentary aquifers. So the Alberta number one, it is a new drill planned in a hot sedimentary aquifer. The deep earth energy production that we talked about earlier, this is a new drill in the Williston Basin, another hot sedimentary aquifer. They are in the the test drilling is completed and they're finalizing engineering for the phase one 32 megawatt installed capacity plant. Both of these projects and the other two projects in Canada are all really leaning on oil and gas industry data. And then they are more focusing on new drilling, not necessarily well conversion, but focused on the drilling. So they are really directly targeting these large utility scale power, power projects. So let's jump over the pond to the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, they have, they're in the development and feasibility phase. Two different projects, both announced in 2021. One, iGas. This is a partnership with Serify Energy to reuse existing onshore gas wells in the Lincoln area that is down here in the East Midlands uh, properties of iGas. And this would be utilized for district heating and cooling per the, per the release. Another announcement was made by Third Energy. They are partnering with, they first announced partnering with Geothermal Engineering Limited in April, 2021, and then further made a an additional announcement partnering with Seraf, Serafi Energy in June of 2021. Again, this is gonna be a direct use project also in this same section of the United Kingdom. And notice these are both direct use heating and cooling. One thing we've looked at is the North Sea. What about the North Sea? What about offshore geothermal? Well, there's a lot of talk about reutilizing North Sea platforms for geothermal. These go back to 2018, 2020, 2021. Here they, there's active exploration looking at offshore geothermal, specifically with reutilizing existing infrastructure. I don't know of any public active projects. And I see the chat, I, I'm saving questions till the end, FYI, but feel free to continue to, to send those messages in. The next section, moving over into Europe, in the Molas Basin, there's an oil field redeployment is the way that, that this was stated. This is in Austria, again, was, was announced in 2021. These are at the feasibility stage in the Molas Basin of Austria, and the company is ADX Energy. They're an Australian company. This is a, another August 2021 announcement in the exploration stage. Their main goal is to utilize their existing infrastructure, the wells they have, and all of the different piping and pieces to utilize to utilize the heat they're producing. They did have some partnerships with Siemens and one or two other groups, I think really looking at lowering the temperatures that they can produce electricity from. 
It is also important to point out that here, the red stars are existing geothermal power plants. So in Germany, near Munich, and right on the border of Austria, there are existing power plants anywhere from the 0.2 megawatts or 200 kilowatts up to 3.4 megawatts. It's also another one further south and, and east. So they're in, ADX is in the right general area. We know the Molas Basin has potential for geothermal electricity. It is interesting to point out that some of these fit for purpose drillings are still only generating 200 kilowatts. So well conversion here in a quote unquote proven area where we have existing geothermal power. And there many is a, a stretch. There are existing plants at this small scale. Now the Huaibei oil field in China, this is a binary flu screw expander. This was done in 2011. There's a lot of really interesting stuff with this Chinese project. So the first one, they were using a screw expander instead of a traditional organic rain cycle turbine. So this is a different kind of turbine style or generator style. This was a pilot test. And the pictures here show the, the oil water tank where the water was coming in the cooling tower, the heat exchanger here on the bottom, and then the actual power generator with the turbine with the expander in it. This resource was about 18,000 barrels of water per day at 110 degrees Celsius or about 230 degrees Fahrenheit. They ultimately installed 400 kilowatts was the size of this screw expander. They had a gross production of 360 kilowatts and a net production of 310 kilowatts. This was all coming from three production wells that they optimized for, for water production. So they basically pumped these wells as hard as they could, and they were getting ultimately a, a 13 to 20 percent or 13 to 20 times increase about 350 barrels per day up to 6,000 barrels per day at only at a 98% water cut. The, there's a few parts here. One, at this, at this stage with a 98% water cut, they didn't get a drop in oil production. So they still had a roughly 2% oil cut coming from these wells, even after increasing their production 15 to 20 times. The other aspect is that their temperatures originally, when they were producing 350 barrels, were about 50 degrees Celsius. And once they really started cranking on them up to 6,000 barrels of water per day, they jumped up to that 110 degrees Celsius. So this project, I think, is one of the most interesting because it shows that you can get a fairly high production rate, depending on where your field is in terms of, of decline curve and water to oil ratio. You may not get a change in that. And depending on what the drive is of the field, you may get a significant increase in temperature. So you really can produce those, those static bottom hole temperatures if you're flowing the well fast enough. They also had one injector well that they basically utilized to show the connectivity of the field and to demonstrate that they could build pressure support so that they wouldn't deplete their, their field. Unfortunately, since 2011 and 2012, when these, when these uh, results came out, I haven't seen any further results. There has been a lot of work looking at thermoelectric power generation from the same professor and, and then a few other ideas trying what it looks like is 
trying to find ways to generate electricity at these low temperatures. And what they must have identified is that the main issue is the heat to power conversion, not necessarily the production itself of the water. So jumping from China all the way down to Australia in the Perth Basin, some of you may have seen that there was there were recent studies and recent announcements into co-production in Western Australia. The hydrocarbon company Strike Energy acquired a geothermal company who had co-located geothermal leases outline over the top of Strike Energy's oil and gas leases. So this is in the Perth, Perth Basin, Western Australia. Basically what has happened is now Strike Energy owns both the oil and gas and geothermal leases, all these blue areas, they own the rights to both the hydrocarbons and the heat. Some basics on that, the temperature at the wellhead is 115 degrees Celsius. Here, if you've ever been to Perth, it is, it is fairly hot, and fairly dry during the summertime. So you're going to have another similar issue in terms of summer power production, because it's not going to be, you're not gonna have a significant temperature differential to really generate the power you need. Here, I think it's really interesting and what, what I gleaned from the public information, it, this is really a co-location strategy. The, both the geothermal and the gas are located within the same sandstone reservoir. So really what Strike is doing, and this is my interpretation, what they're doing is they're hedging their resource production to be any potential resource so that they're de-risking their drilling. If they end up hitting a well that they thought would be gas and turns out to be all water, well, now they can produce it for geothermal electricity. You do have a problem because most oil and gas wells are smaller than geothermal wells, and the well design is going to be different, but this is, this is one potential way to turn a gas well into a plan B geothermal well. Right now, they're performing further analysis to really to, to map out and define the geothermal resource. So there's no hard results yet, but they are still in active exploration. And then finally, going all the way around, we are skipping Africa and going straight to South America. The first company to talk about is Perix Resources. They made a recent announcement earlier in the year that they have a organic Rankine cycle geothermal pilot project shown here on the right. Again, this is an air-cooled system. Most of these systems are in some type of connex trailer, some type of modular unit that is very easy to move from one location to another and really ship all around the world. But the sizes do vary. This here being a 100 kilowatt unit, this is replacing 5% of their energy consumption within this field, if I'm not mistaken. This is in the Campo Maracas in Pesinar, Colombia. And this is a pilot project utilizing that resource. And they have a second pilot project planned in a similar nearby with an output of 35 kilowatts. I don't know if these are, are gross or net or installed capacity. And I don't know the temperature of the resources as well. This is kind of all that was, was available as far as I could find. There used to be a really nice map floating around on LinkedIn, and unfortunately, I, I couldn't find it in time for this presentation. So other than this information here, I have not been able to find any other public results on production or resource 
or the, the resource temperature and flow rates. This is kind of all we've got. And then finally, Echo Patrol in Colombia, they, in the, in the same information, there was a announcement that they had a pilot project that they had planned in the Chichimine field area. The plant capacity there was two megawatts of electricity. No new results on that. And then recently, my company, Petrolearn, made an announcement that we are performing further evaluation for geothermal resources for Echo Patrol. So that's kind of all of the all of the easily accessible, clear projects that that one can find and ones that I've been keeping up with and utilizing for this for this idea of oil and gas well to geothermal conversion. Some observations to make from this. In the United States, we've had multiple co-production projects, yet none are operating today. Why is this? I think it's because of our, our market, really. The commerciality of those projects varies. And ultimately, depending on who you are and what what your business model is, those projects don't align. So I think that's where we end up with, with, a, with, with the standstill we have in the US. In Canada, new drilling seems to be the norm. They are focused on the co-conversion of wells. It just seems less common. In the United Kingdom, they're clearly focused on the heat aspect. I think this is a factor of multiple different things. If any of you have caught talks from, from Geothermal Limited or from Serafi, they there's, there's a almost complete ban on, on any type of stimulation activities in the UK. It's very difficult to modify and really produce the amounts of water you need, and also to produce from deeper formations where you're gonna have higher heat capable of generating electricity. So I think the UK is focused on heat. The other aspect to the UK is that, as I was thinking through this, they also being a, a older country, if you will, they are likely more used to district heating systems. Whereas in the US, we really any I haven't seen a radiator since since my undergraduate, well really since since living in Iceland. So I think that that is another aspect where we don't have district heating as readily available. So we can't just go and start converting wells to pull off the heat. We have to rebuild a lot of infrastructure. Whereas the UK as a little less that they may have to build. China, the Chinese project in the Huawei field, they optimized their wells and the optimization worked well in this high water cut field. It's important to point out here that their power output was 360 kilowatts gross versus the estimated 550 kilowatts for that same temperature and flow rate resource, looking at the MIT report from 2006. So this is important to remember that at these low temperatures and low flow rates, ultimately we are still fighting a, we're fighting a battle against delta T, that temperature differential, we're fighting a battle against thermodynamics. So we're going to potentially have lower power production, even with high flow rates and, and decent temperature. In Australia, I think Australia is interesting because you see a different company strategy where this company is coming in, Strike Energy is finding a way to de-risk their drilling by owning the rights to all potential resources. I think that's what's going on. Obviously, there is a good geothermal resource there, 
the Perth Basin is known to have this resource, this geothermal resource, and now Strike Energy is, is capitalizing on that. In Colombia, there's not a lot of public information. There are multiple companies, they're at different stages. These are the newest companies in well conversion. And I think that is why there's the least amount of public information. I wanted to touch on what are ways that we could further de-risk this. One way to further improve is to do this full geothermal resource evaluation, going from data cleaning and characterization to a full-scale analysis and screening, doing the probability mapping and making data-driven decisions. We have a lot of data out there and not all of it is being looked at. So if we're just looking at a few wells or, or existing public knowledge and not re-examining all of the public data that is available, I think we're gonna be missing potential resources. And the next step would be doing a conversion screening process using some type of screening tool and a streamlined workflow. This is one of the kind of holes that we saw, which is why we developed our convert deck tool. The idea is that we can now use knowledge to drive well selection and we can optimize it for evaluation efficiency and ultimate profitability. We look at over a hundred parameters within this tool. The idea is that we go in a stepwise fashion so that at any single point, if the resource isn't there, we stop. We don't have somebody working on the energy demand, the financial analysis, and the permitting. We first know, is the resource there? And so on and so forth. And the idea here is that we can always go back and look at alternative end uses. Say you don't have an electricity market, then the idea would be, do you have a heat market? So to give a summary of low temperature geothermal in sedimentary basins, there are previous demonstrations to produce geothermal electricity, heating and cooling from these lower temperature resources, that being about 150 to 300 Fahrenheit, 80 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius. This is, and these are happening worldwide. We've got examples from nearly every continent. At these temperatures, if you're using a binary system, this is ultimately a zero emission solution. I think that this is really where a lot of geothermal is going to go is binary geothermal power plants because of the zero emission solution. As we chase and, and a fully zero carbon power, this is one of those that, that is going to win out. And as a reminder, if we're generating electricity, geothermal is base load, it is firm, flexible, and reliable. Existing well co-production and conversion projects, the, the best of them can be about three to five cents per kilowatt hour and internal rates of return above 15%. Geothermal energy production, because of all of these things, is geothermal energy production in hydrocarbon fields is a clear transition path from a petroleum company to a low emissions energy production company. And finally, the finding the right combination of reservoir, well bore, producer, end user, and governing framework. Combining all of that, it is complex but it is navigable. And this I think is one of the important parts why well conversion is not discussed more. I think with all of these ideas, maybe it will become more popular. With that, thank you everybody. I thank you for your time. I think we are starting to run over two. 
So let's open the floor to questions. Well, thank yes. you so much, Joseph. We will end here um, for everyone tuning in. This is recorded um, and that will be shared on YouTube. So thanks for tuning in.